to make services reliable. What do I mean with services, reliable services? Services that, despite failure, they're going to be able to stay up after the failure scenarios happen. It's not so much about being able to deal every failure that is out there, because at some point it's unrealistic. You cannot be up if the things you depend on are not up. The idea is you should be able to continue to be up after the fact, and things should be moving forward, and you should be able to figure out what's going on quickly. Um, this workshop is going to go from the very beginning, um, starting with foundations, starting with what are the libraries that I recommend for serious Haskell projects. Um, and then we're going to go into different uh, strategies like supervision trees, timeouts, circuit breakers, and whatnot. Um, so I'm just going to go with agenda, introduction setup, which is going on right now. Um, start with a solid, solid foundation, and I'm going to explain um, the purpose of custom preludes and why you would like to have one in your project. Um, then we're going to talk really quickly about standardization in your team workflow and how that is so important for people to work together well. Um, then we're going to go through managing configuration values succinctly. A lot of the complexities of managing services in production is being able to know where your values are coming from. You don't want your configuration values to be in your code. You want your configuration values to be as customizable as possible. The, this is a library. I'm going to show you a library that helps you with that. Then we're going to talk about defining your application in layers. Um, some people here are really knowledgeable on this. So if you feel like you want to pitch in, please do so. Uh, model sensitive components as reliable process. Uh, dealing with flaky integration points. And uh, uh, lastly, we're going to have to embed it into one that is being able to run a mock of AWS in your box for testing purposes, uh, and also how to inoculate your system so that you know that your um, reliability strategies are working or not. Right. Um, so first of all is, if you don't have Stack or Cabal, please install it. I personally recommend Stack because the setup for Stack is already there. I heavily rely on snapshots from the uh, long-term support of Stackage in order for this uh, projects to work. So sorry if you really like Cabal. Stack is the one I recommend in here for now. Uh, clone the project repository. Um, the repository is in Roman. If you go through the repos, it's going to be one called LC2018 Rock Solid Haskell Services. And in there, we're having five different small uh, projects that we're going to be going through through the whole workshop and the slides if you want to follow along. Um, the slides, the way I'm presenting them right now is through HTTP an HTTP server running on my local. I don't open the HTML files. If you open the HTML file, it works great. If, it, if it's not, uh, just start a local host 3000 with Python or something. Um, Download Toxic Proxy CLI and Toxic Proxy Server because we're going to use that for the last exercise. Install Docker because we're going to rely on Docker for um, the mocking of AWS in your local machine and also for PostgreSQL uh, databases um, on our programs. Uh, with that, I'm going to wait for, for anyone to tell me that they're having trouble setting up things. Um, especially Docker, Toxic Proxy, and Stack, and cloning the repo. Like, if any of you have a question at this point around this, please let me know, and I can help you with that. It's a binary in Go, compile binary. Oh, so I just make it executable. Uh, you have to go to, like, if I go to Shopify. Toxy proxy. Just, uh, oh. Let's go. Let's go there. Um, I'm, I'm gonna put that link on the channel, and uh, it has all the binaries for each of your architectures. Uh, you have for Linux, you have for Windows, and you have for Darwin. So I just need to make that executable. Yeah, like download it, made it executable run it and see that it works. 
um, both the server and the CLI. There's two binaries. Okay. Um, I'm gonna give three, like three to five minutes, and move on for that. Okay. Um, please grab me if you need help. Yeah. Um, there's a channel on the FP Complete or FP Complete. Sorry, no. The the functional programming Slack called Haskell RSS 2018. Um, I can give you the repo clone. Uh, Oh, I have a wrong URL. Sorry about that. The link is. Uh, no, we're gonna run the um, locally on our machines because setting it up on Docker with other Docker dependencies was quite um, difficult, and I don't want to go. I don't want to make you go through that. It's easier just to install the binary. Um, okay, that's the repo to clone. The URL to clone the repo. Um, no, it could be, as long as it's greater than 1.6, I think it should work. Do you know if it's installing via homebrew for project proxy does both CLI and server? I haven't tested in, in Mac OS, sorry. Yeah. OK. So for the people that is coming in, that is just getting in, there's a channel on the functional programming Slack called Haskell RSS 2018, where there's a bunch of links of things that you need to download. Um, Okay, I'm going to continue with the slides. Uh, it's okay if because I'm not going to be coding anything just yet. Um, but yeah, just following along. Um, the first point of making really solid programs in Haskell is starting with a solid foundation. And um, for that, you more than likely want to go with a custom prelude. Uh, raise hands, anybody that knows what a prelude is in Haskell. OK, so the most majority knows. Uh, just for a quick overview, Prelude is the library that gets implicitly included in your Haskell programs. So it's a standard library, more or less. right? Um, it's known that the Haskell existing Prelude is filled with warts. Uh, it has a lot of unsafe functions to use that they will barf in your face if you don't use correctly, with runtime exceptions. It doesn't provide um, data structures that are fast or performant in any way. Um, and more than likely, you're always going to be requiring libraries that are not on your prelude um, that any service uses, like byte strings for dealing with bytes. 
tax for dealing with UTF-8 tax in a fast way. DeepSeq for um, evaluating, like removing the lazy evaluation out of your data structures. Like there's a lot of standard libraries that you use in every project. And uh, if you use a custom prelude, it's more than likely that custom prelude is going to have those libraries included in it. Um, there's two options I recommend, uh, Rio and Protolude. I used to use Protolude before in all my projects. Uh, it worked pretty well. But then I switched to Rio and things simplified greatly. Um, I'm going to recommend Rio for this workshop as well, uh, given that. And um, I wanted to, for you to get started with Rio, like just feeling at how different it is from the um, regular Prelude. So for that, I have a project called One Small Program on the um, repository. If you already set up everything that you needed to set up, um, we can get started with this. And it's going to go together into exploring this project. Um, OK, let me, there we go. So I'm going to clone the project the same way as you guys, so I know things are working. Uh, 2018. And I'm just going to go to one small program. And I'm on the Emacs editor right now. So it's a literal uh, Haskell source. Anyone familiar with that format of a Haskell source by any chance? It's it basic. So it, it flips out the comments with the code. If you want to say code, you have to explicitly say this is code, rather than the other way around. That is the full code, and you have to specify the comments. Um, in here, we have an explanation around what are the different things that you can use with Rio. We always want to start, start with a set of pragma language annotations. Who's not familiar here with langu language pragma annotations? You can raise your hand. It's OK. OK, so I'm going to assume everyone knows what a language pragma is. Um, and just import Rio instead of any other library, and you have a bunch of um, stuff already included. So I'm going to go and start a REPL on my editor for this. Oh, no. OK. It's of course, start failing. I'm going to first do uh, a stack build so that I can build all the dependencies that I need. Is that better? Yes. The resolution is pretty bad, and the space is not that big. So if I increase the fonts, I don't have space to work. Just heads up. Um, so I have a stack build there. I can do stack REPL as well. Let's just do that for now. Um, the first thing that we will see in this code is that we have uh, a main that it's equal to main proc. I'm sorry. And main proc, uh, no, it's not main proc. We have this main trace over here. That's the, f that's the first one, which basically allows us to do a hello word. What's the first thing that you notice here? that is different from vanilla Haskell. The fact that we are not using putster line, right? Uh, we only have this functions called traces. So if I go and do browse Rio and look up for the trace functions, I have a bunch of trace functions there. Uh, trace ID, trace IO. This is the normal way you would use putster line in, in Rio. Um, you have Basically, you can, you can use this inside a monad or out outside a monad without any problems. The only thing that's going to happen, though, is that as soon as you compile this, uh, it's going to fail with a warning. Or not fail. It's just going to show you a warning saying, hey, trace IO is deprecated. And the first question is, OK, how can I get rid of this warning? Why have this warning in the first place? And what can I do in order to not have it? Um, Tracing, it's like uh, this. The, the uh, tracing is for using uh, debugging on uh, putster lines. 
Like whenever you're having a debugging in your software and you're starting to output a bunch of put stir lines, that's what tracing is for. Normally, you don't want that on your production code. You never want to, um, if you want to output something to the user or something to uh, someone to read in production, you never want to do it in a way that is like that. You want to have a logging information that has a level. It has some metadata that you can follow along so to know where it's coming from or what is the level to filter or not in production or whatnot. Um, given this, Rio offers a logger included in the library, which I think is really nice. Um, starting with uh, this main logger, it's similar to the function that we had before, but we have to build a logger and then we have to run a mono transformer that has the logger function inside. As soon as I have that, I have options to log info uh, or log debug or whatnot. So what I want you guys to do is load this REPL, uh, do a stack or REPL, and on the main function, just use main logger. Um, and let's start playing with that. So I'm just going to do a save in here. And I'm going to do a reload. Um, don't mind the warning because we're not using it right now. But uh, as soon as I do that, if I do, or sorry, before, just to, just to compare, let's do main trace, or uh, what is the name again? Main trace load it, and see what happens. So we have the vanilla behavior of uh, hello world, as you will have it with the store line. If I do main logger and save and reload and do main, we have way more information here. We have information about what's the log level, at what time the log happened, where did the log happen. This kind of information is really important when you're debugging stuff in production. You want to be able to know what's going on. And also, a lot of times you have stuff for debug. You want to be sure that you're not uh, logging, like you're not seeing stuff that is for debugging purposes unless you put the flag for debug, right? So right now, we are creating this main logger. We create an options that receives a handler. It can either be a file handle, it could be standard error, it can be standard out, and one Boolean. What this Boolean means is if I want to be verbose or not. Verbos in this case would do exactly this at the date, at the timestamp, and everything. If I do uh, false in here and I reload and run, I'm just going to have the behavior as I was having it before, right? Um, a lot of times you want to be able to verb, like, add specific uh, verbo settings. There's a bunch of options that you can do with log options once it's um, built. So, I can say, for example, log options set uh, min log level. I can say the min log level is error, level error. And it's going to be log options one. I'm just going to use that instead in here. If I reload, uh, oh, set min log level, variable not in scope. Um, if I don't have the function at the top of my head, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into uh, hackage package Rio. And then I'm going to go here and look up for log min level. Set log min level. And it, yeah, I basically flip the order. So if I go here and I do that, and run it, you would see that now uh, the log info, hello world, is not logged in in the output. Yes? Yes. Uh, there's a way to do that. You can uh, specify a flag. Let me. Uh, you can do a new IO ref, right, with the value. Uh, and we can say here is vervos. And then you can say something like set log vervos format. Actually, that's possible, but not on the latest release. Like there's in development, I added that actually. Um, if you go to the head of Rio, 
as it stands right now. You have an option that says set, as you have set log verbose format, you have a set logs verbose format IO that allows you to specify that IRF with a value. And you can manage that IRF independently of the logger and you can. Does that allow you to basically change everything in the option? Not everything. Because it does, like, when you're building the handle, uh, or when you're building the options, we do certain things to the handle to uh, improve the behavior when it's running on terminals. So changing from standard out to a file handle is going to cause some struggle. So we are really limiting the scope of the things that you can modify. At this point, what we believe makes sense is the log level and the verbosity. Uh, because normally what you want to do, why, why we would like to have this feature? Because say you're running a production system and suddenly it starts misbehaving and you have a bunch of information on log debug, but you don't have access to it because it's running on log info. If you have a way to modify your program so that you can inject that flag and modify it, you automatically can see the log debug information on a running system, which is huge. If you have a system that is failing, you want to know why, and the log debug will help you substantially in that. So these kinds of features are really important for production usage. I haven't seen the, uh, the ampersand use like this. Do you mind clarifying what that is? Pardon? Like log options with the ampersand? Oh, so this is the same as doing that. So imagine, I think uh, ampersand is just flip of dollar. Well, it um, re-exports it by default. So I like to do that when I have a record and I'm doing setters on it, so that it looks like, OK, and you can like concatenate many of them. You can say set other thing, and then you can have it align like, like that. Um, right? So yeah, yeah like you're, you're like piping all the settings in it. Um, yeah, great question. Uh, so, so far, that's the thing that allows you to do a Rio by default is having a sane logger that you can use for your programs out of the get-go. If you're trying to do tracing for debugging purposes, go away and do trace IO, trace display, or whatever. Um, it's going to throw a warning so you remember you have to remove it, which is great because you don't want to have like strenuous outputs in your standard out when you're using uh, a, a sophisticated login like this, right? Um, another aspect that is really important that I forgot to mention is if we look at, at the signature of log info, you will notice it's not a text, it's not a string, it's not a by string, it's something called UTF-8 Builder. And UTF-8 Builder is a type that you can create by using a function called display. So what is display? Display is a replacement to show. We don't want to use show for purposes of serializing things for uh, humans to see. Why? Is for two reasons. The first one, show uh, serializes stuff into strings. Strings are slow. Second, you have a rule. Uh, it's not unspoken, but it's not follow it most of cases where if you have a show instance, you got to have a, a relation with the read instance of that type. So if you show something, you should be able to get that same read and get it back. Right? That's why you don't have stuff for show like an IO. Because even though you can say, oh, this is an IO or whatever, you need to be able to have a read instance to read that uh, output that the show is outputting and get back the value. Right? There's that unspoken rule. A lot of people like to use show for debugging purposes and like do human readable stuff. Don't do it. Because that, as soon as you do that, you break the contract with a read type class. And you don't have that advantage. Granted, not many people use read for parsing stuff, but it's convenience that you don't have to lose, right? So um, display, if I go and look at the information at display, I have a bunch of things that um, implement the display type class, right? And um, as long as I just do display of the value, it should work. Worst case scenario, you don't have a display for your type, but you don't care. You just want to do a show. You have this thing called display show, uh, which gets a show constraint, executes a show on it, and then transforms it into a UTF-8 builder so you can use it on your logs, right? So let's see how that's, that works in practice. So let's say we have a, um, 
let's here with a number one two three uh, and I just do uh, that number oh sorry uh, if I try to load this it's not gonna work because um, that uh, okay but now it's not gonna work for something else that is hey um, the actual thing here doesn't work because it's not a real log of fun. This is because we have to wrap this in parentheses as a first. After that, if I do reload, it's going to tell me, hey, um, I could have uh, get UTF-8 builder with end. OK, that's great. I'm just going to do a display in here. Cool. Um, and then it says something around the lines of, yeah, I remove the log options, so I'm just, boop, now things work. Um, yes. Any questions about this? So display is specifically for performance by using builder instead? Yes. It, it, it helps with performance, and it also helps with not having to use show for human readable stuff. Right. right? You have to do display yourself. You have to do explicitly display yourself. Um, one thing that is was a big, a bit of a WTF moment for me was if you try to do display of a byte string, it's not going to work. Why? Because a byte string is not guaranteed to be UTF-8, and we are talking about a UTF-8 builder here, right? So if you want to uh, transform that, like if you want to display it, you can do the display show. Um, but most of times, you just want to make sure that you're dealing with UTF-8 in case you want to render human readable text. Do you have to use uh, Rio to get this logging functionality, or is this logger available? Um, you can have it available without uh, all the Rio machinery. You need the Rio dependency, though. Like Rio, it's included in the Rio package. Okay, so you, it's not all of huh? It's not all of part. You need Rio. Like, you, can use, you can use this with a run reader T. Like right now, we're using that run Rio there, you see? And that run Rio is basically a reader T with IO fixed. I can go ahead and put there run reader T, and it's going to work. Ergo, you don't necessarily need all Rio things in order to make use of this login library. You do, however, need to pull all the dependencies that the Rio package brings in order to have this logger in particular. OK. That, of course, take more than I expected. So. Let's continue. Um, any other things that you have questions about this code? Oh, there's one, one more thing. And we're going to just do a quick uh, overview of that and not dig too much because we already spent all the time on this section. Um, but you have uh, like the real monad comes from the implementations from a stack, right? Like there's a lot of stack legacy in the real library. And one of the things that Stack does a lot is uh, it spawns processes um, for various purposes, like Cabal or GAC. Given that, there's a, an API that allows you to easily fork processes and do um, various things with it, right? Um, here in the code, there's a main proc example that has a usage of this API where we have to define a process context and we have to run an, in a monadic context where we have a process context and the log func function that we're creating. And then we can do stuff like that and it will just work. So um, if I go and replace main logger with main proc and reload here and do main, this um, API where it shows me the command that I'm running, it shows me the output. It, it, uh, because of the implementation here where I do run process underscore, the standard out of the process is going to my own standard out. But you have different ways to work with that. You have a library called process type process that is pretty good. 
in comparison to what you have with the standard process library, uh, where you can like move that um, standard out into other places. Um, yeah, just wanted to pinpoint that particular feature, uh, which is a really nice one to have if you need to be spawning processes often. Okay. Um, cool. Any questions so far? Great. Just going to move on then. Uh, we already did implement a small program in Rio. Um, let me just bring a bit of water. I'm going to do a quick note. This is something that probably you guys know already if you have been working for a while in software development. But um, I think it's really important for any production system to have some way to unify how you run programs. Um, and I would like to advocate for that from, from a painful, really painful experience that I would like to show, um, share with you. At one company, uh, we were heavily relying on the CI server, uh, it was Jenkins, to do all our processes as a team, uh, manage dependencies, manage that things were going through the pipeline. Um, we rely heavily on the pipeline. One day happened that um, the pipeline was taken away from us because of security issues, and it was not brought back. Um, like, it was like, no, no, it's gone, and you have to deal with this now. So we have a lot of things on the pipeline, and suddenly we have a huge halt because we didn't know how to do all these things manually. We didn't know how to do all the pipeline operations manually, and that was a huge pain in the ass. Um, it took around a month and a half in order to get things done again, and we didn't want to make, go through that again. We didn't want to have to, in case we lose our CI, we don't want to have to figure these things out again. So what we did is we rely heavily on make files in order to write down all the different steps that you need on the CI pipeline. And every stage on the pipeline, it was basically a make call. Um, why we wanted this? Because first, we were able to execute it manually if we needed to. Secondly, the steps that were on the make files work both on the local development box and on CI. So we could have a sanity check around, yes, I'm testing stuff correctly the way in CI is intended in CI. If we needed to change CI to something different, like Travis or Circle CI, it was just changing the, changing the format and keep using the same make, make tasks. So it's really important, it's, it's very, very important to have a way to unify those tasks into something, it doesn't have to be make, it has to be something that is outside the scripting language of the CI that you're using, right? You, you don't want to have shell scripts in your CI scripts, on, the, on your Jenkins file, on your Travis YAML, no. Avoid that at all costs and always use make files for those kinds of tasks. Um, some things that I personally do in my code, not necessarily in all the codes that I work together with people, but in my own code and libraries I maintain, I always like to keep a pipeline where I have all these tools in place. Uh, HLint, Refactor, Stylish Haskell, Brittany, or HEndent. Brittany is the one I use because it's more stable and I can just rely on that even though I don't like the output. Um, and yeah, I don't like the output and I know if that output gets improved, it's just one call away to get it. So uh, I, want, I want to showcase really quickly how that looks on an open source project that I have one of the open source projects that I have. Um, let's go with So if we go to this project, first of all, we have a make folder here. And this make folder has a bunch of smaller make files um, with different things. Uh, in this case, uh, let's go through the tools one. It shows um, how to run every uh, like how to format the code, how to remove lints, how to get like report the lints only. Um, and the way it looks is something like, let's see. If I go to terminal here, uh, let's go to a new terminal. And I go to Haskell, Kavadas, do make, make uh, tools. If I do that, I automatically get what are the things that I can do with this make file. I can format, I can help, I can, well, I hope it's just this. Lint and remove lint. If I go to a different file, sdist, this allows me to uh, build a distribution binary, test that distribution binary for release just to make sure that it works with the latest package. 
and um, many different tools, right? Um, I like to keep those and Solver, this is for testing nightly. Uh, it, I just execute fix solver and it modifies the uh, stack.yaml to work with the solver on latest, uh, on the nightly release of, of snap uh, stackage. Uh, the way I, I use it on um, my CI, in this case is circle CI, is I just have, you see that the scripts is basically make tasks all over the place. And I just run those. And for me to move from Circle CI to Travis or to the next best thing, it's just as simple as understanding what's the semantics for that CI is and just add those make tasks. Done. It's, it's, and also, I can run this locally and I can validate that things are working. Right? Um, in the projects that we're going to be looking, there are some make directories there. Um, I also like to keep a, a, a global make file with the common stuff. So, for example, this make file has build, test, bench, clean. Um, if I just do make in here, it will print it out. And uh, build, I, why I not use stack build alone? Because I have this practice where I have an out folder um, and a bin, and I just run it from there. Why I do that instead of a stack sec? Because a lot of times I'm changing the flags on my binaries, and I want to make sure that I have a binary that is compiled with profile in its own folder, and I can use it, right? So in this case, if we go to out, and we look at three in here, you see that profile has a bin directory with the same binaries. I know 100% those binaries in there are profiled. So I have a task that uses those flags embedded, and I just do make profile, and boom. Away you go, right? Um, it becomes kind of like a burden because you have a lot of small tasks. But if it's stuff that you're going to do regularly for testing, you don't want to have to remember the options. And you don't want to have to share that with others. You don't want to have to say, hey, make sure you run the program with these flags in order to make things work. Um, I highly recommend whatever tool you're using, if it is Rake, if it is NPM, if it is whatever, just standardize on that tool and make your team work together in those. And whenever you want to add a feature, just add it to the make file or to that specific file. Um, let's go back. Yes? What is Refactor? Refactor is a tool that you execute with either Lint or Brittany that if it's trivial enough, it will refactor the code for you on the fly. Oh, really? Uh, it's called ap apply refact. Uh, the package is called apply refact. The tool, the binary that it compiles, it calls refactor. That's a misunderstanding. So if I go to um, package apply refact, there it is. Perform refactoring specified by the refact library. And when you compile this on stack, it will build that refactor tool. And HLint, like, let me show you. Um, in the make for uh, tools, there's one for format. You will notice that um, there's a write in mode place in here. That write in mode is using, or no, sorry, that's not, uh, Brittany uses its own. HLint uses refactor uh, internally, and you can specify, hey, use refactor, and as long as it's globally available for this executable, it's going to use that and refactor automatically for you all the lens. So I like to, what I like to do in my pipeline is I apply the remove linters and do a git diff. If there's a difference with my code, it means I have lens that I need to remove. And I just execute that, commit again, and the pipeline just works. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Oh, one thing I forgot. You, you, you may ask, why do I have things separated like this. Why, why I made this decision of separate the different make tasks into different make files. I want to, like the, that code that is on those files almost never changes. And I want to just copy paste it between projects. Um, before I had everything in one make file and the differences between the different make files were so granular that I was not able to reuse the same make file everywhere. As soon as I started to split that make file into different make files, I was able to say, oh, I just created a reusable make, make file 
that as long as I put it on a project, it's just going to work. And that helps me a lot when I'm moving in between projects because I just standardize once and that's the way it goes. Uh, okay, so going back to what's the time? 10 49, we're going to be one hour in. Okay. Um, cool. So going back to the slides, sorry. Okay, so this is the time that I had for the break, but we can continue because we have like 45 minutes more before the break. Um, let's just continue. Let's go with uh, managing configuration values succinctly. Um, I, I'm very curious, what are, have you had experiences with configuration in production systems? What are the things that you hate the most about that? Just want to hear rants right now. Yeah, I'm a character out of place. So I didn't go for them. People have mentioned their own DSLs, basically, in terms of configuration. Mm. That's one. Fragmentation and format frequencies. Okay. So I wasn't joking. <laughs> Everything. I learned to untype one character out of place, so I didn't go for them. Everything goes to hell. Like, so when you say one, one character, you mean on the value or you mean on the. Like, doesn't matter. Okay. Mm. Okay. Yeah, like if you have a version configuration, it's it it's helps, but you cannot version everything because you have credentials, right? Um, a lot of people like to use this thing called SOPS. I don't know if you have heard of it. It's um I think it's Mozilla who implemented it. Um, allows you to have the configuration file as a YAML file with the entries. Uh, unencrypted, but the values are encrypted, and you can just um, put that into the repository. And as long as you have, you don't have the private key, you cannot. Um, but yeah, like that's that's one approach. Another approach is use parameter store for those those credentials. Um, but there's different approaches that none of them are really streamlined. Okay, um, I have dealt with um, a lot of configuration challenges in the past, and um, I came across a lot of different things that I didn't like. Um, let's see if I talk about that. Um, no. Um, starting with what happens when you do, like, when you have different environments, how do you deal with that? Like, a lot of people just use files uh, with development, production, staging, but a lot of times it, it becomes rather arbitrary that it's a staging and, and you have to share settings in between them. So that never quite works. Um, you have environment variables where you, like the 12 factor way says, oh, you just put everything in environment variables. What happens in the deployment, you have a type on your environment variable. Things stop working. Um, types, like what happens if the environment value, environment variable value is a, is a string when it's supposed to be a number. Um, there's a lot of things like that. And um, the idea though is we still require to the configuration and we cannot add it in the code. And, as soon as you have a default in the code, that for me is a smell. Um, defaults should not be in the code. Defaults should be documented somewhere. You want to have an aggregated, like you want to have a canonical spot where you see all the default values of your configuration. As soon as you do something like data default, um, th there's a package called data default that a lot of people use and always uh, tell them not to because first of all, it's a bad use of type classes. And secondly, you are embedding the defaults everywhere in your code, and that, that, that's pretty bad. Um, there's different strategies for configuration that I know of. You have configuration files as we talk, we have environment variables, and you have CLI options, right, uh, or parse applicative. You just have to, instead of specify all the environment variables, uh, specify the dash dash option on the um, environment that you're running your application, right? Um, you have to have the, those things embedded in your script, and hopefully you have a way to get those um, credentials in those CLI options easily. The question is, should we pick one, um, or should we pick more than one? What are the complications of picking more than one? 
you have conflicts. You have, okay, what, which one should I use, right? Or uh, what happens if they are not the same value, right? Pretty much top to bottom. Top to bottom. Uh, like, it should be like that, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Great you think that. <laughs> because um, I th thought the same thing. Uh, and why? And it's not just arbitrary. Um, you see that each of those has a level of specificity. Like, when I say configuration file, I'm not actually specifying that. Someone made that decision for me and put it on the repo. When I put environment variables, I'm actually telling the program, hey, I want to change the value. And when I do CLI options, it's still ultimate because it could have happened that I did an export environment variable and I forgot about it. If I have a CLI option, I actually say it in the spot, hey, this is the value that I want, right? So that should have precedence. Um, so I implemented a library that does exactly that. Um, supports everything uh, and allows you to define a spec for all these things. So all the different decisions around those configuration values what are the parse applicative flags? What is the environment variable name? What is the default value? What's the type? All of those live in a spec, and that spec is versioned. Uh, and as soon as you specify more than one configuration value, it will merge all of them. And it will tell you, hey, yeah, I acknowledge to you that I know about this configuration value on file X, Y, Z. I'm not using that configuration value because you specify a CLI option, and that has precedence, right? So right now, I have an example for this on the repo, but before getting there, I want to go into the examples of the et cetera project. I didn't want to have to redo this work again because it's already there. Um, and it's going to go together and explain how that, how that works. Okay. And I, is it okay if I have it like that size or is that too small? Okay, perfect. So it's going to start with a plain example. Um, there's only a main file in here. And the way I use it is I have a spec YAML file that I read and I create a configuration spec. This configuration spec is going to have all the metadata of all the different values that I have on my configuration and where they're coming from. And I have a decision to make. I can say I want to get all the values that come from files. I want to get all the values that come from environment variables. And I want all the values that come from CLI. Each of these maps over here, config files, config env, and config up parser, are maps that contain just the values of that source. If I merge them together using mapend, they get merged into a single configuration. And when they get merged, they get ordered by precedence, the precedence that we were talking a second ago. If you're a CLI option, you're going to have way more precedence than if you're a file. And if I, run, if I run this particular program, it's going to do a few things. Because the configuration spec knows what are all the environment variables that I have on my program, it's going to go and look up all the environment variables defined in the process, and it's going to check for differences. If there's a typo because I forgot a letter somewhere, it's going to report me and say, hey, I think I found an issue here. Uh, you're misspelling this, uh, this thing. Do you mean that? That's one of the features. And the other one is print pretty config that will get all that map with all those different sources and show you where the values are coming from. We're going to see that in just a sec. Um, but most importantly, before like we said, we saw the code and how it aggregates all the data there. How does the spec look like? So it's divided in a few sections. The first one is files, where you say all the different paths where your configuration files are going to be found. Right? You have these paths over here, and it tells you, okay, I want you to pick up the configuration from my local resources directory on a file called config.jaml. Also, if there's, a fault, if, if there's a file on the root, et cetera, uh, called the name of the program config.jaml, I want you to pick that as well. If you pick that, those values around that file are going to take precedence over the previous one. 
this works great for deployment of production systems. Why? Because a lot of times you have all the development uh, settings on a local file in your project, but on your deploy script, you put the configuration of the environment on a particular path. As soon as you do this strategy, the library will override the um, configuration values for that particular environment by just the ordering of these files. Does that make sense? You mean by the ordering the list of every path? Yes. So the uh, et cetera, et cetera plain example, because it's the second item, it has precedence over the first item. Right? Uh, and, it, and again, when you say print the configuration file on a pretty, in a pretty way, it will show you, hey, I found this configuration file in resources config, and I found this configuration uh, file on plain example, et cetera, plain example. I'm going to use the one on et cetera, plain example. Just heads up, right? Um, that's a way to do it. There's another way. A lot of times you have a one-off configuration that you don't want to have to specify because it's not that formal, say for Docker or whatever. You can use a, an environment variable that says the path of the configuration file, it's pointed by this environment variable. And it will take precedence over anything else on the files realm. Okay. Um, then there's a section for metadata for the CLI. This is what you will use for your up parse applicative, where you specify the different options and the strings that you want to display when you uh, do a help. And then it comes to your actual configuration map. This is your configuration as it's going to be on your program. Um, at this uh, particular program, I have an entry called credentials. And this credentials is going to be a map that contains two more entries, username and password. You will notice I'm using a special prefix key here called etc. spec. This allows me to define the metadata for that particular key. So I can say, OK, when you have username, the default value is going to be root. The environment variable that you want to use to override this value is going to, call, is going to be called my app username. And, when you're pa and I want also to have a CLI option that is going to be like this. It's going to be an input of option. It's going to have a short of you. It's going to have a meta virus of username. It's going to have this help string. It's going to be of type string. It's going to be required. Um, for password, we have something similar, but we also say that it's sensitive, meaning when you're printing the configuration thing on your log, if you see this key and it's sensitive, just obfuscate it, say it's sensitive. This is where it's coming from, but I'm not going to show you in the logs. So that way, you don't leak passwords on your logging. So that's enough talk. Let's see some examples running. Uh, is there a way to build that kind of configuration data in Haskell rather than in No, not yet, at least. Um, there's a rationale behind that, that it's a legacy one, but still a rationale. When I developed this library, I was trying to push Haskell on a company that didn't want to use Haskell, of course. Um, and I showcased how configuration could be done in a way that works for, for that company. And I wanted to showcase the example in Haskell, and I wanted to implement that same standard in other languages. There's a possibility that I can say, I want to have a library in Ruby that has the same syntax, and it's going to work, behave the same way. Right? Okay, cool. And the CLI options take precedence over the environment variable? Yes. Can this be integrated into a program using Octoparse applicative for things beyond configuration management? Um, what do you mean? Can you integrate it too, you say? Yeah, can I, can I compose these? Um, sadly, no. Like the, implement, like the fact that it's using a parse applicative at the inner layer is an implementation detail. And there's no exposure of the up parse applicative. The thing is, too, um, when we are building that configuration map, um, let me show you something. Examples. Command. Let's see if this. Or no, let's just go here. Better config example. No, this doesn't have it. Um, I'm gonna go to an example that we're gonna look at later, just for the configuration, uh, just just to show you the configuration how it looks like. Um, let me go into 
here. Five. Source. Uh, no, I want to go to app. App. Component. Mm, yeah, let's do this one. So when you're getting that config map, you get the values, you, you can plug the values using this notation, right? Where you say, I, have a, I know I have a path on my configuration map that has the value that I need for this to work. I'm going to plug out of that. What is going on internally is it's keeping the representation of that value as a JSON value internally. And it allows you to parse it using from JSON into your API. Um, the way that value gets in there, it's, it doesn't matter to the program. And that's the cool thing, because that value could come from environment variables, could come from files, could come from up par CLI, and your program doesn't need to know anything about that. right? Um, and the best of all is, say you have a configuration record on your API. Say you're using uh, persistent SQL and you have a record for uh, connection. Well, you have actually a connection string. Um, let me show you that. There's uh, another example here. It's actually this exercise. Um, if I go to app and main, I have a way to say, given that the value is JSON, get this JSON parser. The same way you implement a from JSON instance, you can say, I want to implement one of those parsers, and I want to get all the values that are on that JSON um, record. So I can say, for example, I have a database, and database have all these entries. I can say, give me database, and get this uh, JSON parser, and get me all the values out. Um, that's exactly what's going on in here. I have a parse connection string to connect to the database. And uh, I just use a vanilla JSON parser I would use with any APIs with all my settings, username, password, database. And then I just go and create the string that I need to connect to the database. And I can say, OK, get me this configuration value with the parser for connection string for the database key. And the database key is something that has other entries inside with the spec with the sources that they need in order to be filled. And this parser doesn't need to know that those JSON values that are inside it are coming from CLI or environment variables. So we have a split of separa a separation of concerns here, where the way you can parse your configuration doesn't need to know anything about where the configuration values are coming from. Does that make sense? I unify, so the APIs for the different resolvers, what they do internally is they traverse all the different uh, options. Like they, they traverse the map of configuration, and they build dynamically or parse parsers or environment variable parsers and keep the value inside there. Those parsers, uh, like for example, for the CLI, it transforms things into JSON values once it gets it from up par CLI. Does that make sense? Yeah. 